Hello and let's talk about the Bihar elections. The first phase of polling concluded yesterday with nearly 54% turnout and the second and third phases are set to take place on November 3rd and November 7th. The first phase saw 71 constituencies in the fray, while the next two rounds will see contests for 94 and 78 seats respectively for a total of 243 seats. The two main fronts are the NDA which comprises the BJP and Chief Minister Nitish Kumar's JDU in addition to some smaller parties and the Mahagad Bandhan comprising the RJD, the Congress and the three communist parties, the three CPI, the CPIM and the CPIM at Liberation. Now there is a wild card in the form of LJP of Chirag Paswan which is opposing the JDU but not the BJP candidates. The election is one of the most important in recent times not only for the state but also for the country. What will become of Nitish Kumar and his party? Will the BJP emerge as a powerful force due to its polarizing campaign and the spoiled sport impact of the LJP? Will the Mahagadbandhan's promise of jobs and struggles of the left be able to defeat the status quo arguments of the BJP and Nitish? We talked to NewsClick's Pranjal to find out. Thank you, Pranjal, for joining us. So, a very heated context, uh, contest is on in Bihar and uh, an important election for the whole country, not just for the state itself. So maybe quick, quickly take us through what are probably the, mainly the key issues that are being talked about on the ground. News click reporters have been on the ground for many days. What are the key issues that are being discussed and are likely to influence voters' behaviors during the election? See, it's really difficult to comment on what is going to influence voters' behavior in elections. But if you look just at the campaign and what the two camps are doing on the ground, you can get a sense of the issues. Uh, for the Mahagat Bandhan, which includes RJD, Congress, and the left parties, the issue is clearly unemployment. Unemployment has been one of the biggest issues in Bihar for last many years. There's a massive number of exodus that happens from Bihar. People go out looking for work and all kinds of work. But with a large number of migrant workers coming back to Bihar, this has come to forefront. Corruption has been one of the issues. There has been a massive rise in crime in Bihar and even in terms of crime in terms of caste-based atrocities. You keep getting reports about these uh, incidents every day. So crime is one of the issues. When you see campaign of uh, the BJP in Bihar, they have been talking about Article 370, Ram Temple, Galwan Valley and all those things. Somehow these issues are missing when it comes to campaigning by the JDU and the uh, BJP in the, in the state. The other key issue also in uh, Bihar would be the mismanagement in, in case of COVID-19. They have, Bihar in between had seen a massive surge in COVID cases now the numbers have come down, but the hospitals are less. Uh, the health infrastructure in the state had completely collapsed. So these are, for me, I think the key issues which are affecting, uh, which are uh, being projected by different camps. For uh, RJD, it's more of people's issues for market Bandhan. BJP is trying, BJP and JD are trying to bank on the so-called good work they have done for the nation. Absolutely. And in this context, an interesting thing is that, uh, say, a while ago, it, it did seem like the NDA was in a fairly strong position. Right? That was the common consensus among a lot of the media. But even this media has, over the last few weeks, begun to acknowledge that the Mahagat Bandhan is actually likely to perform much better than expected. And the crowds in the uh, election rallies often bear witness to that also. So could you maybe talk about how uh, what the signs on the grounds are on that, in the sense that how what what has been that underlying current that has been boosting the market? See, I mean, I would like to look at it from basically two three points of view. One, yes, the opposition that is the market Bandhan right now is drawing massive crowds when it comes to public meetings and the election campaigns. People were not expecting it to be so big. So obviously, I mean, if you just look at the number of people participating in the election campaign, you can say that the Mahagat Bandhan is in a strong position. But who is going to benefit in long term? Difficult to say because this just now only the first phase of voting has concluded. Uh, one thing for sure is very clear that the biggest loser in that terms would be the JDU because there's clearly a massive anti-incumbency against Nitish Kumar government. Is BJP also facing that? Not too sure. Uh, but definitely, the. but since the face of the entire 
alliance is also uh, nitish kumar so that way the bjp jdu combined is in a tough spot if you look at narendra modi's uh, campaign rally yesterday he even didn't care to mention nitish kumar even once in his election uh, speech that he was making i mean passing remarks have been made but there has been no talk about what nitish kumar government has done the entire projection by the bjp has been about what the center government or the bjp government has done and also then the other issues with bjp rss have been trying to push for a long time so that's obviously one part of it so definitely nitish kumar is going to suffer and with the ljp card that has been played ljp fighting separately on all seats against the jdu but not the bjp that is definitely going to have some kind of impact on jdu's performance what is the game plan behind it is there any understanding between bjp ljp and all is it a deliberate move difficult to say but uh, the scene but it's good it's going to be a closely contested election that is what one can say right now absolutely and and finally as far as the mahagathbandhan is concerned we see that uh, of course tejasvi yadav has emerged as a leader in his own right which people were not expecting but also the fact that the rjd and the congress are making an understanding with the left has definitely contributed to uh, this uh, performance at least in the election rallies as well because the left brings a strong cadre as well as a series of issues which others don't talk about so there has been a renewed emphasis on issues of social justice and people's issues as well i would think I mean, so that's where we started from. If you look at the RJD's campaign, they are talking about unemployment. They are talking about COVID mismanagement. They are talking about crime. These are the issues that the left parties have been known for raising over a period of time everywhere in the country, and especially in Bihar. Definitely, see, you have to understand why did the left come into this uh, entire alliance? Left has had a massive presence on the ground in uh, Bihar. They had a good. number of seats a couple of years ago obviously electorally their performance has declined in past few years but when it comes as you rightly pointed out when it comes to the cadre base they are still there they have continuously raised issues of the people on the ground even during the lockdown they have organized protests done relief camps for the migrant workers all those things have been done you also need to see that the another reason for bringing uh, what my understanding is bringing left into the alliance is they bring a different set of voters to the mahagathbandhan rjd is known for a solid say minority uh, yadav vote bank but they also need others and especially other smaller other backward caste parties have also aligned with the bjp that way that vikashil insan party sanis party manji is with bjp ljp is fighting not fighting against bjp so you need a section of the vote which is primarily the marginalized section of the state to vote for margaret banner if they have to project a strong chance of winning that is the vote which the left brings in for margaret banner and even within the left the cpi ml liberation has had a good presence in bihar last election they won three seats despite fighting alone the entire election and the left consolidated is fighting 29 seats cpim 4 cpi 6 19 for ml liberation and all the seats that the left is contesting they have a strong presence on the ground there how many are they going to win difficult to say but obviously if you just look at the voting pattern last election also some of these seats the cpm cpi liberation lost by a very marginal a uh, difference so even if they get that vote to the mahagathbandhan mahagathbandhan seems to be in a very strong position so for me if i give my final concluding remark it would be i personally think this is going to be a fight between the bjp and the mahagathbandhan and somewhat the jdu would be left out of it thank you so much prajal for talking to us in our next segment we bring you part of a conversation between writer vijay prashad and giles unapakon a thai intellectual and writer on the protests that have been raging in the country for the past few weeks tens and thousands of people have taken to the streets demanding reform of the monarchy and proper democracy thailand has some of the strictest laws against criticizing the monarchy and is ruled by a military backed government run by former general prayut chanocha giles talks about the history of the monarchy military complex in the country and the kind of resistance that is building up giles welcome welcome to people's dispatch and news click thank you for inviting me 
Well, you know, Giles, we're in the middle of this major uprising in Thailand. Um, Thailand, of course, has a history of coups uh, that goes back to the Palace Revolt, 1912, the 2014 coup, and so on. Um, give us a brief sense of the role of the military and the monarchy in Thailand. I think this is a useful introduction for people who don't follow Thailand closely. Give us a sense of the role of the military and monarchy in Thailand. And of course, in all this, where is the United States of America? Well, before I talk about the history of the uh, monarchy and the military, um, you said that Thailand has a history of many coups. But at the same time, Thailand has a history of mass uprisings against, the, against military dictatorship. And um, those mass uprisings were successful on two separate occasions, despite the violence used by the military against unarmed protesters. So really, we should, we should see the long-term picture as a struggle between the people at the top, the military, um, the royalists, the conservatives, and the people um, at the bottom, the ordinary working people, um, farmers, and so on. So, so I would I would put it in that context. Now, the um, <clears throat> the monarchy is actually. Um, if we start with, uh, for, for example, nation building in Thailand, um, King Tula Longkorn or Rama V um, staged a revolution against the feudal system. It's basically a bourgeois revolution from above. Um, this kind of thing happened in, in uh, countries where um, the revolutions had had occurred late. For example, um, a very similar thing happened in Japan with the Meiji Restoration. So the king abolished um, the Thai feudal system in, in the 1870s in response to the incursion of colonialism, the incursion of British imperialism and, and French imperialism, and, and created the nation state of Thailand. But at the same time, he made himself into an absolute monarchy. But this situation was unstable and only lasted about 60 years because in 1932, in the midst of the um, world economic crisis, there was a revolution which overthrew the absolute monarchy. And it was uh, led by a coalition of left wing politicians and um, anti-royal um, military men. Um, the problem is that um, these two factions that overthrew the, the, the absolute monarchy um, weren't, um, weren't looking for, the, the, for similar outcomes. The, the leftist, left nationalist politicians wanted a kind of socialist society. Um, the military people wanted um, something to the right of this. And, and so um, it resulted in, in, in the number of um, toing and froing between the military and, and the civilian politicians. But it was the um, Cold War, really, that um, established the, the role of, of the military dictatorships in Thailand. And they were supported by the United States. And it is during this period that the you know, military sort of um, brought back the monarchy, if you like. The monarchy hadn't been totally abolished, but they, they started to, to um, promote the monarchy um, as a symbol of conservatism, of a symbol of anti-communism, and so on. And, and and ever since then, um, the Thai monarchy has been <coughs> promoted like this, mainly by the military, but also by um, capitalist politicians, right-wing politicians, and so on. 
The current protesters, the majority of them actually believe, well, I would say the leadership um, actually believe that the, the present king, Wachialong Gon, is trying to establish an absolute monarchy. Um, I disagree with this. I think that the monarchy in Thailand has always been um, a tool of the military ever since um, the Cold War period. Um, king Pumipon, the present king's father, who died recently, was weak and uh, unable to actually, uh, he, he was cowardly and, and, and just went with the flow, really. He, he enjoyed being made and promoted into some kind of godlike figure uh, by, the, by the military, but he didn't really have any power in himself. And the present king, um, well, he has a history of, of, of failing exams, of being totally um, uninterested in social affairs. Um, is, one could say he behaves a bit like a, a sociopath because of the way he treats women and so on. I mean, he's, he's got a harem in, in Germany where he spends most of his time. He, he treats his consorts who he falls out with them in, in a barbaric way. Uh, some of them are just put in prison and so on. But, you know, the, the monarchy itself doesn't, can't actually control the military. It's the other way around. It's the military that use the monarchy. Um, it's the conservative elites that use the monarchy. Now, in order to understand this, and you, you can see pictures of top military generals, um, including the present military dictator in Thailand, despite the fact he, he um, claims to have been elected, although the elections were, were false elections. You can see pictures of them groveling on the ground in front of the present king almost as though they are, you know, servants of this king. Now, I think you have to almost be a, be a Marxist to, to actually understand what's going on. It's a play act. Um, it's basically the military and the elites foster this view that the monarchy, the king, is some all-powerful godlike figure. And the reason they do that is to put the fear of this godlike figure in the minds of ordinary people. And they have been successful um, over the years in doing this. And of course, monarchies are very symbolic, not just in Thailand, but in, even in places like Britain and, and Sweden and other places, because they represent the idea that it's natural, supposedly natural for some people to be born low and some people to be born high, and you need to know your place in society. Now, it's taken to an extreme version in Thailand. Um, but, you know, Marxists have, have talked about the, uh, the, the idea of, of alienation. If, if you are weak, if we are weak, if we don't feel confident and powerful, um, we tend to believe all the crap that the ruling class um, Put, put forward in society. And those beliefs can be shaken through struggle. And that's something like a, a number of Marxists have talked about. And you're seeing this happening in Thailand as we speak, because um, the, the, royal, the, the, the view, the fear of, of royalty, the fear of, which is imposed also by um, Les Majesty laws and people being prosecuted, but but also, you know, it, it's it was it was a mainstream view in society in the heads of many many millions of people, but this has been shaken. It's been shaken by um, the struggles that, that have broken out of the last few months. It's also been shaken by the behaviour, the reality of of the of the present king. And so we've seen, we've seen um, 
unprecedented criticism in public of of the present king and the way he he um, is trying to amass wealth um, through changing the constitution and the way he spent his time in in Germany um, um, with his harem and so on and and and, and his total disregard for 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 ordinary people and and that has um, meant that the present demonstrations um, have got uh, one of their key demands is for the um, reform of the monarchy um, to allow people to criticize the monarchy openly and to to reduce the the um, the the wealth of the monarchy and 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 to um, control his his behavior now this is something that um, is unprecedented as I've said but it's also something that the military are not going to not going to allow very easily unless you know there are strong uh, powers within um, social powers within the demonstration to to actually press the military um, or push the military out overthrow the military because the military depend on this image of the the royal family and and so on in order to legitimize their their authoritarian rule so so in summary i would say that the if you're looking at the the military and the monarchy the military is uh, is the main power base they have the weapons they have the pe- the the armed um forces and so on and the monarchy um is a bit like the fairy on top of a Christmas tree. Um, it's symbolic, but very strongly symbolic. So that you know, it, it was symbolic enough to 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 get people to to actually feel fear or love or whatever or respect for the monarchy in the past. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from the country. Until then, keep watching News Click. Thank <laughs> you.